Greetings, Kerbinauts! This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number nine of Project Odyssey. Last time on Project Odyssey, we were launching a couple rockets that had only just barely gotten started. A crew carrier and a new satellite. However, in this episode, we're going to get started with a new module for our Odyssey space station. Fear not, we're launching this now, but we're not going to see it dock quite yet. We need to go back to last episode where we had just begun launching that Hydra crew carrier because we have a few Kerbals who are going to finally make their way up to the station. So let's go back, back to when we were launching that and the capsule had just finished decoupling that protective shroud that sits on top of that carrier. Back to when we had released the side fairings that also protect our solar panels and make sure that we have the power we need for the life support, and then pushing our apoapsis up toward the station's orbit, just coming in within a few hundred meters of the station and circularizing while keeping our close approach vector right there on that orbit. Notice how even though we're circularizing, that close approach is still staying really close. And that's exactly how we like it because we want to get ourselves there as quick as we can. However, we were also launching a new satellite. Now this satellite is from last episode and what we were doing here is I pulled up my Ferrum aerospace window so that I could watch the Q value. The Q over there, if you don't know what that is, it's your velocity squared times the atmospheric density which gives you a number that shows you exactly how strong the aerodynamic forces are on your rocket. And as we get closer here, moving up into the high 20,000s, we are now about to pass through what's known as max Q, and the value will start going down again. And we know that now, from here, everything will be just fine. There won't be any problems with our rocket whatsoever. Unless, of course, we were going too shallow through deadly re-entry and start burning up. As it turns out, I was so fascinated with watching my terminal velocity and my Q value that I wasn't really paying any attention to the heat. And we got going really fast and blew almost completely apart. And yet, the payload stayed protected. Ooh, maybe we could continue and launch like this. I think we're going to make it. Excellent. All right, well then, why don't we just pretend like nothing happened? We'll just decouple and throw off that one half of a fairing that still happened to be on there. And then we can deploy our pristine satellite. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this whatsoever. What could possibly go wrong now? Other than maybe if we were to have put the hinge on the wrong part. So when it tries to open up, it is, uh, yeah, okay, maybe not so good. All right, well, we're gonna let this one go back down into the atmosphere after all. We are still suborbital, so deadly reentry, you wanted this rocket, you're getting it. And there it is, gone. All right, we're going to go back down, whoa. You hear that? All right, that's strange. All right, we're gonna reboot, actually. All right, so we've rebooted and we've relaunched the satellite again. Uh, well, not really rebooted the whole computer, but we rebooted Kerbal Space Program because I'm not quite sure what was going on there. And now we're going to watch as we go from this low behind the engines view. And oh, look, there it is right now, the moon. It's peeking from behind the rocket. Come on, moon. Come on, moon. We can see you. Show, there you are. All right, so pointing straight at it, horizontal across the surface of Kerbin, but 40,000 meters up. And now we have lost all of the fuel in that lower stage. So we'll pop that fairing and bring down that lower stage. Here we go. Whoosh, down it goes. 
and away we are heading for the moon. This satellite is going up there because we need to do some cathane scanning. We're going to put out our solar panels here and then deploy the internals. We have like a little blooming flower sort of satellite here. It's got communications and cathane scans, moon surface scans, all kinds of sensors. We're going to get that all the way over to the moon and then we're going to decouple that lower stage because until it's gone, until it's out of fuel, we're going to be using that in order to make our way over there. So this is the burn. This is the one that sends us on our way. Another attempt to just completely ignore any kind of maneuver nodes. The moon was on the horizon, so we are going to just fly toward the horizon and hope that that brings us with an encounter to the moon. Let's see what happens. So there it is right there. We're burning our way out, going at super high speed here, and oh, too far. Went too far. All right, well, whatever. We got to set up our communications. We'll get back to that in a moment. We got to make sure that we're pointing back at Kerbin with our satellite dish here. All right, we'll use our RCS to back off just a little bit. And sure enough, that brings us to an encounter. However, we're going to keep it going there because what I want to do is I want to get that lower stage to actually collide with the moon's surface. So here we go, zipping up over and coming back down. You can see that we are on a collision course right now. So once we get a chance to switch down here and actually flip around and decouple there, that thing is going to go and smash into the surface just like we had planned. Now we've got our cathane scanner ready to set up and our scan sat sensors ready to go as well but first back here i noticed that uh, not all of my engines while i was checking all my config files not all the engines were set up with hot rockets yet and i wanted to see what they all looked like right now so i was going through them one by one just by sticking them out here on the launch pad with all these different fuel tanks uh, obviously not trying to launch anything that looks like this this is just activate an engine then activate the next one see what they look like see which ones might need some hot rocket support and which ones look like they might be okay the way they are Ooh, that's a good one i think that was actually one of my hot rockets engines so obviously it's a lot better with that and then once that was done i was like eh, let's see what happens when we blow this thing up we brought it out here we're not going to do anything with it what's that going to be like and so i explode it and well it was actually a little underwhelming since the camera kind of flipped away and well there's that trail where's that going oh i don't know it's gone now anyway we will come back to the satellite that's heading for the moon. We will even come back to this launch right here where we're heading in for our docking to the space station. Because first, we're going to go down into the vehicle assembly building and take a look at some of the things that we've built recently. Okay, so sitting down here on this FASA launch clamp and another FASA launch clamp there, we have our regular lower stage and fairing protecting that satellite that you just saw. We'll zoom in here a little bit and you can see we have our normal stage down there with a decoupler and a little engine that is protected inside a, a ring of six little custom-made monopropellant tanks. We have our big satellite panels right there and our RC and batteries and our cooling system which I think maybe I have working finally I found out that interstellar I accidentally had two copies of the open resource DLL and it was conflicting and making it so that nothing was going into my waste heat thing there all right, so if we look at these panels down inside here, you're going to see that I have a bunch of sensors all around on the inside of them. See, sensor, sensor, sensor. And we have uh, the different things in there that when I take this off, it's actually because it's symmetry, they're all gonna disappear, but you saw the basic idea there. We got the hinge and the hinges were over in our little panel there. All that infernal robotic stuff was right there. And we have now, uh, you remember, that I had said I wanted to do multiple CPUs. So you can see here we have the one for attitude and control and we had one for scanners and one for communications and a big battery so that we can go through the dark side. Uh, and we had the fuel and that's it. So now let's take a look at the next thing. 
This one was the communication satellite that had to go to the moon. It's all basically the same stuff that you've seen a few times, except for this part, which should look fairly similar to a TDRS satellite, except it's the moon data relay satellite. But it's got the same basic features. You got your engine and monopropellant tank, the fuel tank with the RCS on there, different communications, computers, and scanner things, and we got the cooling, whoa, gone. All right, I hate it when I do that. Whenever you accidentally grab the thing that was your root part and delete it, you can't actually control Z. I really hate that. Anyway, you see what's going on here. you got some batteries and different, some more computers, attitude and control, uh, antenna computer, and the different uh, communications dishes on the two sides there. That there are the 20 megameter ones that allow me to communicate uh, one to Kerbin and the other one there to the other MDRS satellite that will be on the opposite side. We launched those last time, so you've already seen that. Ladies and gentlemen, we are making our final approach to the Odyssey station now. Please make sure your tray tables are in their full and upright position and that your seat belts are secure. A flight attendant will be by shortly to collect all snack wrappers and juice boxes. Out the front window, you can now see that we're passing a Centaur second stage and the Perseus crew module, and should be arriving shortly. We here at Kerbin Space Command know you have no other options for your travel to space, and therefore assume you don't mind the fact that the parachutes on this thing only had a 50% chance of successfully saving your life. And we thank you for traveling with us today. Please remain seated until the space capsule has come to a full and complete stop, docked to the back of the Ares command module beside the Athena airlock. Remember to collect all of your belongings and be careful when retrieving objects from the overhead bins as things tend to shift around a lot when subjected to several Gs traveling at Mach 15. If this is your final destination, then let us be the first to welcome you to the Odyssey Station. Weather on board is climate controlled and hopefully still has oxygen. Once again, thank you for traveling Alternal Kerbin Launch Systems. Oh, Kessla, Kessla. I'll bet you didn't know that Kessla has been developing quite the reputation for being the practical joker around base. I guess he's just trying to keep the, uh, the mood light because you could probably get really depressed very easily to keep thinking about the fact that there's only eight of you on this entire planet and that you may never see your home again. Anyway, we're transferring our crew over into the station using the crew manifest mod. And then Neil is going to go outside and take a look around just to make sure that everything looks okay. Kind of zoom along the side here all the way up one side and then go down and under around to the other side and down and just look at the both sides there, make sure that everything is in order and that they don't need to do anything like any repairs or head back to Kerbin, worst case scenario. But it does look like everything is okay, so he is going to head back inside, and that's going to give us a chance now to see what it looks like inside for the Kerbals up here, floating around in the station. There were a few strange readings inside the station. You two stay in the capsule while I go in and check it out from here. I'm detecting a strange energy signature. Beginning a scan. The energy seems harmless. No harmful radiation. I think it's safe. Oxygen and nitrogen levels are within tolerance. Temperature within tolerance. Yeah, you can come in. I'll go check on the life support systems while you continue analyzing the strange energy signature. You look happy, Bill. That's good to see for a change. Back here at the moon, we have our Cathane scanning satellite moving itself into what will become a polar orbit. Obviously, it's a lot easier to make that maneuver when you're still pretty far away. That way, it's a lot cheaper. 
we were doing a slight radial maneuver there, moving the uh, periapsis away from the surface so that the satellite itself wouldn't collide, but also doing that inclination change, combining the two of them together, but also doing it really far away so that we're going very slow makes it so much cheaper because the inclination change, the cost of it is based on how fast you're actually going at the time that you make the change. So anyway, we're down here at the surface and I pulled in the panels a little bit because I gave it a, a little throttle and it had some issues with stability and that's why you see that we have that big eccentric orbit there. I closed the panel some to make it more balanced but it was too late and I couldn't slow down enough but we did get into a very elliptical orbit. We'll open up all of the sensors and then I'll go back out and we'll make one more maneuver in order to finally bring down our uh, orbit here into a circular orbit since I sort of missed it that first time around. Ah, beautiful view of Kerbin there over the horizon of the moon right now. And now we're able to get this down. I knew that with the panels open now, it would be a lot harder to maneuver. It's only throttled up a tiny bit, but we're so close to having it circularized that that's not really much of a problem. And finally, we go back out to the apoapsis one last time to raise the periapsis. Now, we wanted those initial burns to be really close to the surface for efficiency, but now we want a nice, high, circular polar orbit so we can just zoom around here doing our cathane scans, and we'll let that run for a while so that we can get all the information to find out where we'll be doing our reference missions. And now we return to the present, jumping ahead to where we were at the beginning of this episode when we were launching our new space station module. This module's purpose is to keep the station cool. It's going to provide a little extra tank space for some propellant to make sure that we have enough in case we need to transfer any over to any other vessels that might be docked there or perhaps just to boost its own orbit and there it is the fairing has been released the stage has been released and the module is just shifting itself over onto the proper course so that we can fire up that centaur engine and get underway so anyway, also on there, there are a bunch of radiators that I have configured in order to work with interstellars, uh, the, the waste heat there. And I have managed to fix also the interstellar waste heat. As it turns out, the problem was, ooh, look at that really nice intercept I had there, if I say so myself. The problem was I had had the uh, two, well, okay, let, let me back up a second, actually. So interstellar, I don't remember exactly how long ago, but it had reconfigured itself to work with this other mod, a different mod called Open Resource System. And Open Resource allows uh, different mods to interact with the re different resources that you might have and to add and subtract things. And it's just this API that allows things to be a little easier to manage. Well, Interstellar was using that in order to transfer waste heat in and out of your waste heat bar, basically. And what had happened for me was I accidentally had two copies of the uh, open resource DLL inside my open resource folder. I had one older version and one newer version and I guess for whatever reason there it was using the older version maybe or maybe just the fact that both of them were there it got confused somehow with different functions. Well anyway to bring that longer story to a close uh, all I had to do was delete one of those DLLs and it fixed open resource which now worked which means my my actual waste heat is now working properly and that means I do need to worry about my radiators because up until this point it hadn't been working so I'd been well I'm gonna get to it maybe I'll write my own waste heat management mod or something like that and but now that this one's working maybe I, I won't I'm not really sure Okay, so here we are at the station, and I'm going to have to flip over here and bring in that solar panel because it looks like I'm coming in from behind it. I'm going to sort of ease in underneath and dock up. So I've got these special docking ports that I've configured. What I did with those was I took a truss segment and then I buried inside of it an actual docking port so there'd be a docking node, but then uh, I welded it together into one part, which you can get out of my files if you have downloaded them, and those parts 
parts together then act as a docking node and I renamed the docking node so it's not actually the same name as the others. Normally it would be called a size one docking port. Well I renamed this one to a larger size and that means that it'll only dock, those two pieces will only dock with each other which is exactly what you'd expect. I mean they're really big and you don't think that you should dock up a spaceship or something to it. Uh, speaking of docking ports, I've got one on each side of that long integrated truss. This is very much like an ISS thing where I've got that truss and I can extend it out in both directions if I want. I can add all kinds of power by running out to the both the starboard and the port sides there and the radiators on that middle section should be more than enough to handle any kind of waste heat that might be generated from any size solar panels. Okay, also I noticed when I docked up that uh, the, the different resources that I wanna keep track of there for like uh, life support, food, water, oxygen. It, I, it turned out that it was a little hard to actually see which ones I had and which ones were low when I had it interleaved with their waste. It was going where it would go, well, like oxygen and then carbon dioxide and then food and then food waste. But it turned out I didn't really want that, so I've just moved everything up a little bit to group them all together and put in a new separator. Now we'll bring out those radiators. Those radiators are actually Cosmos solar panels with the texture removed, just like on my ISS. The radiators are now deployed. But don't open that module yet. Let the scans finish up. They're still going. I'll check the temperature and then you can go in. Computer, begin secondary scans. Enhance any anomaly signatures. Activate biological detection system. All right, computer, I'm going to take a nap. Wake me if you detect anything. Another one that we never actually got around to showing in the previous episodes, we have on the bottom clamp here a solid rocket booster for the lower stage of the rocket that sent up the airlock. Now if we pull that away right there, we can see, oh no, there's nothing special going on. All we can see is that I had uh, a camera on the side. That's the only difference. You've already seen that. That's my standard launcher. But we do have this new tug. This new tug right here, this part is a new sub-assembly that has uh, the fuel tank down here and uh, computer and batteries and antenna and all six different little things here for uh, RCS control. You have to balance those out by putting extra RCS up somewhere on the part that you're trying to move. Although as it turned out, you saw in the last episode where I had put this out there that it was really hard to maneuver this even though I had the RCS on there and I think it had something to do with the fact that I was trying to dock in sideways but I'm not really sure it could also just be that there's absolutely no torque whatsoever on this whole thing so it just wanted to keep uh, rotating in whichever direction it was already traveling so if we pull that off there you can see that I don't really have a lot of parts on here in fact I've now removed any computers which means my mech jeb has disappeared but if I stick one on there, I'll get that mech jab back again, which will allow me then to, where is it? I thought I had a part counter. Oh, uh, yeah, part count, 21. Okay, so some of that stuff is just things like, uh, this has to be a special part to keep it, it being able to rotate, and these were extra parts that I added on here so that I could actually maneuver it around. Those won't be on there. Once I get a chance to go up and do some EVA construction, those will be pulled off. Uh, the lights will be staying though. There were some struts that were holding it in and I will remove those as well once we can get up in there. Also things like the docking ports need to stay uh, separate. So uh, those things, that should be an extra part right there but I can't seem to get it. Well there is a part right there for the airlock. So uh, imagine that had, has been removed. And so we're down to eight, and I imagine that there's not, I don't even know where they are. Oh, there, I was able to get it off. Well, anyway, I just did the same dumb thing again where I accidentally deleted the root part, so I had to come in here. But if we just go over here and find that module, uh, you can see what it looks like in its welded state before I have attached any of the extra stuff. So there it is right there, and I'll just stick it on there. Nope, I'm gonna have to flip it and put it 
uh, like that to be able to see it. So that's what it looks like before it is uh, a, has any of the extra stuff attached to it. You can see the majority of it is on there. Um, I had it intended to put a docking port right here, forgot to put it on. We can put that on when we're doing EVA. I was thinking it would be a little teeny docking port and that I could use that anytime I want to send up some supplies. It could be just a, like a little supply ship thing that docks in there and then transfers everything over, but no Kerbals would actually be able to go through because it would be too small of a docking port. And now for what we're launching in this one. So you can see we have our basic launcher system down here with that new fairing that I crafted myself out of parts from other mods. So we'll grab that one and pull that away. We also have on here the thing, the uh, Centaur that allows us to maneuver it into place. This is the actual new module. We have on here a docking port right there to connect up to the large docking port that was underneath the station. Some RCS jets to help maneuver it. Those will be taken off by EVA. Docking ports on both ends right there and right there as well as a bunch of cooling units these are like on the iss these are the panels that stick out and they have ammonia running through them the ammonia is stored in these tanks down through the middle i also have some batteries on the two ends to give some extra battery capacity to the whole station and some extra monopropellant fuel tanks in there. Although I'll tell you, I have been thinking about making those not necessarily be monopropellant because with my RSS launches that I've been kind of toying around with as side projects, I like the idea of uh, those actually being real fuels of some sort instead of just saying it's monopropellant and that means something. Like it, it could be hydrogen peroxide maybe I'd be okay with that because that is a type of monopropellant but just calling it mono it's very generic and I'm sort of liking the idea of not having things be quite so generic okay Kerbinauts it's time for me to go play a little bit more and find out what's going to inspire me and end up in the next episode so until then I will see you later Kerbinauts